use of earnings and a dividend would work. Well, that's to take so it. So I'll, I'll take that. I, I think I think it's important. Well, let, let's look at some numbers. Um, we've got about $57, $58 billion in the permanent fund. I haven't checked the numbers. Dow hit 20000 today, so I'm, it's probably around $58 billion. The projections are that we will get about 7.7% 7 .7, uh, return for the next 10 years. I think it's between 6.9 and 7.1%. Uh, historically, we've gotten, I believe, around 8% return over the 40 years we've had the permanent fund. So I don't think the projections are that out, out of line. If you take 7%, multiply it times 57, 58 billion, you're, you're looking at earnings of around $4 billion per year. So the question then becomes, if, if we get to that point, if we go through the cuts and, and, and everything else, and you get to that point, well, boy, you know, we gotta keep our government running. We can't shut down schools. We gotta keep providing troopers and public safety and, and keep plowing the roads. Uh, th then the question becomes, well, how much do you really need from the permanent fund? And so that, that will be the big debate. Uh, and the governor's proposal and the Senate majority's, as I understand it, is to use $2.6 billion per year, which I think is, 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 is way too big. It's just an enormous amount of money. But if you, uh, if you assume you're taking in $4 billion per year with the earnings that we make every year on average, uh, to pay the full dividend costs you $1.5 billion right now. That leaves you with $2.5 billion. Now, assuming you inflation proof for another billion dollars, uh, <coughs> still leaves you with a billion and a half dollars that potentially could be used for government, which allows you to inflation proof, allows you to pay a full dividend. There's a lot of different ways you could do this. You could put, uh, uh, if you, if we did ultimately get to that point, you could put a P constitution. You could do a constitutional POMV. I know in the 80s, the state senate passed a, a constitutional amendment that would have created a 40-30-30 plan, 40% for the dividend, 30% for government, 30% for inflation proofing. Um, that allows a dividend at actually a little bit higher than what we're getting today and allows $1.2 billion for government. So, I, you know, we just need to figure out how much we need at that point. Hopefully we can, hopefully we can resolve it by other means before we get to that. But, but I think you can actually pay a, a, a significant, if not full dividend, and still have some money left over in the earnings reserve if that's the desire of the of the legislature. Did you want to add anything? No, I would I would agree. I think you could do both. But here, here's the thing I want to reinforce: those you, the difference really between Senator Dunleavy's approach and our approach is that that his whole approach is just those two items and the cuts. We're talking about revenue because we actually believe that if you're going to build a state that work that moves us into the future, you actually have to pay for it. And I don't know how many times I can repeat that. That means that you don't operate on a shoestring. You don't you don't uh, you don't build a shack if you want to live in a house. You know, I I personally think, and and I think I, I can speak for my colleagues in this regard that that we those two pieces would not be enough to fully fund a working functional. Uh, state government that we could be proud of. And, and when I'm saying proud, I'm not talking about waste. I'm talking about doing the effective kind of government that actually educates our kids and that actually entices people to want to stay in this state. And so given those two things, you have to have a revenue enhancement and you must revisit that oil tax structure. Those two pieces must happen concurrently with any use of the earnings and, and with any adjustment or thing that you might do to the dividend. I think we're all open to a plan that would that would look at use of earnings and and how we would look at the dividend if we know that there is a, a, a concomitant commitment to revenue and to revisiting the oil tax structure. Can I just add something that's I think really critical and that is, I, I think any use of the earnings reserve must be predicated on uh, protecting the dividend for the people of Alaska. I think uh, the people we, we you know, I, I certainly have heard the stories in my district from people who are just living on the edge. Absolutely, I have a lot of low-income people in my district. Um, people who, literally, the permanent fund means uh, being able to buy kids uh, clothing or or uh, pay for food or you know, just literally living on the edge. And we've, I've heard stories and stories and stories about people who are really were devastated because they were expecting to get $2,000 and they only got $1,000. So I think any use of the permanent fund earnings must be predicated on protecting it, providing a guaranteed uh, receipt. And the way we've proposed is through a constitutional amendment. Um, you know, if there's a better way to do it, let me know. But the, but the problem that we have now is 
by the governor's veto, which we've never had in the history of the state, by the governor vetoing the permanent fund. And if that's allowed, if the, if the, if the court says that's okay, then here's the problem we run into. You can't guarantee the permanent fund dividend. You will never be able to guarantee it because any future governor could veto the permanent fund down to whatever he or she chooses. That's, that's the dilemma that we're in right now. You can't protect the permanent fund absent a constitutional amendment. So we recognize that the permanent fund earnings reserve will likely be part of this solution, but we have to go through the other pace places first, the, the targeted cuts, get a fair oil tax. I mean, we've talked about that for years and years, and we're now getting 3% of the value of the oil that's meant to support this state and broad-based taxes because if we rely only on using dividend money, that's the most regressive option, the least fair for the low-income people. James Brooks from the Juno Empire. This weekend on Saturday, there's going to be testimony on a plan to offer a supplemental dividend, restoring the governor's vetoes. If you were there, what would you tell folks, what would you like folks to tell to say on that plan? Well, as you know, I have a lawsuit that deals with this issue, and I, um, I think it's unfortunate that we're in this situation. I think it's, uh, if you remember, we had a special session, and after the governor vetoed it, I uh, had proposed that we go into joint session to overturn the governor's veto. Unfortunately, um, that was voted down by the majority. Uh, we wouldn't be in this situation had we cast this vote back in July when we had the opportunity, but that's in the past. We're here today. Uh, I think we need to restore trust with the Alaskan people. I think, uh, I don't know that the people realize the, the damage that that veto caused, not only to the people of Alaska, just in trust in the government. You know, a lot of people were shocked that one person could just unilaterally go ahead and cut the permanent fund down to basically whatever he or she chooses. But the real damage lies in the ability, if, if the legislature decides they want to go to that place and use the earnings reserve, I think the people of Alaska will demand that it is protected, that their portion of the dividend is absolutely protected. And you can't, the only way you can do that now, if you're going to allow any governor to veto that down to whatever he or she chooses, the only way you protect it is with a constitutional amendment. I, and, oops, yeah. James, I would add that if, if I and I'm likely to be at those uh, uh, public hearings, my my comment, if I'm asked or given an opportunity to to put one out to the uh, audience of the public, is going to be, you know, we need you to also be willing. And I've been saying this to everyone who's come into my office over the last few days. We need you to be willing to ask your representative and your senator to also embrace uh, these other elements of the plan. You know, you don't you don't get there with just a dividend check, and, and so we if we're gonna you know in good faith, and which is one of the reasons I co-sponsored that bill, if we're in good faith to do a reset, so we're looking at all these issues on the table again, then in good faith I want I want my public in the state of Alaska to put pressure on my senators here in this body as well as my representatives here in this body because they represent everybody in Alaska, to 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 push for meaningful revenue, fair taxes for the fair oil uh, tax structure in this state and for uh, a, a balanced a balanced budget that actually a, a balancing of budget revenue that gets us to the kind of state we envision. I want them to tell the senators that, they, that the state that they want to live in doesn't have substandard standard schools and roads. And part of that message is, is letting uh, Senator Dunleavy know if we're going to be doing this piece, we also have to do that piece, which is not just uh, restoring the dividend, but also making sure that we do all these other pieces that, that help us build a comprehensive budget. So I want to tell people to, to use that same voice that they're bringing to the table for those hearings to bring it to their offices for all these other issues that we need to address, including broad-based revenue. Morning, Liz Rains with KTVA. Uh, your caucus has indicated that it, it um that it, there's a need to act this year, that this problem can't be put off to future years. And you're mentioning the stage-gated approach starting with the oil tax credits and some sort of a broad-based tax. The Senate majority has indicated that it's not looking at uh, either of those areas uh, this session. So what happens if, uh, if the Senate does not get there, does not get through those gates? Uh, should there be action on the earnings this year to prevent this problem from worsening? 
We have opposed action on the earnings until some of the other things happen. And the reason is because it is the one thing, and I sat with the governor and said, the reason is it's the one thing that impacts adversely every single Alaskan and only Alaskans. It, to us, that's completely unconscionable. It does nothing for the 20% of Alaskan workforces, workforce who live elsewhere, make good living here, and invest nothing. They don't care what happens here. They're not part of our community, and they're not participating in supporting our community. It's important to us that those people contribute. It's also important to us that the resources that were granted to us at statehood are developed as the Constitution requires for the benefit of Alaskans. And I would say a 3% share of the, ben of the profits right now is inadequate, not good enough. I would also say that the tax credits and incentives are investment in development of those resources, bring us a return, and we have adequate information to evaluate where those credits are worthwhile for us and where they're simply a luxury that benefits multinational corporations and does not give a return to Alaska. We need that information. Can I just add something also real yeah. quick? So this, this was one of the charts that was produced in one of the committees, and and this shows the impacts of doing nothing or, or the Senate majority plan, quite frankly. Uh, they're talking about several hundred million dollars in cuts and cutting state government, which, you know, there seem a lot of people want to cut state government. There's an impact to that. And the impact is for every hundred million dollars you cut in state, in state workers, uh, you lose about 1,500 jobs. So if the proposal is to cut $300 million, be prepared to lose 4,500 jobs. If you cut the dividend, uh, be prepared to lose between 558 and 892 jobs for every hundred million dollars you cut. If you cut 700 million dollars, uh, you're losing thousands and thousands of jobs all across Alaska. So uh, the, the problem that we're right now is if you take the Senate, and this is why we feel so strongly ab about and concerned about the Senate majority plan and cutting the dividend, is you're, you're talking about deepening the recession here in Alaska. Your costs, you're talking about thousands and thousands of Alaskans losing their jobs. You're talking about businesses all across the state being impacted. You're talking about home prices plummeting, uh, going down even more than where they are right now. So it will have serious, serious ramifications. And Liz, the, 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 uh, the bipartisan majority in the House understands this issue, so I don't understand why our, our own majority here in the Senate wouldn't. You know, they, the, the Speaker of the House and the co-chair, one of the co-chairs of finance down there, have supported broad-based taxes. They uh, they've supported oil tax reform. They have done this in votes uh, votes or sponsorship of bills. You know, last year, as you know, you know from from the session last year, it's clear to us that that this debate can be had between both bodies and internally within this body. So, uh, if they do nothing, the consequences, as Senator Wilkowski and Senator Gardner have said is devastating to the state of Alaska, and it holds harmless people who don't even live here. That, to me, is just an outrage. It should not be perpetrated on the Alaskan people. And I'll just add briefly that the economy is impacted, of course, by the jobs, as we've described. But as we do these un unconsidered or ill-considered cuts of proposed $750 million job $750 million in the next three years, what does that do to our ferry system that supports the tourism industry, one of our bright spots? What does it do to the fisheries when um, DNR doesn't have the resources they need to do fish counts and things like that? What does it do to healthcare, which is our fastest growing industry? What does it do to preparing our futures when we're destroying our schools and our university system? What is our vision as a community for what do we want our state to look like? I want 